Howdy, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. In this episode, we're going to be continuing on the kind of theme of time, lost time, new years, lost years. And this one's titled Revolutions of Time. It's an article about biblical stories, the history of man, and rediscovering or reigniting our understandings of ancient America. As always, thanks for being here today. And let's jump right into it. Again, Revolutions of Time. This article is from 1853. We're starting all the way over here on the left. Excuse me. Again, American antiquities, the revolutions of time. Origin of races, different complexions of mankind, and the power and omnipotency of the two agents, fire and water. And as I need to do from time to time, acknowledge that the views of this writer do not necessarily agree with my own. And I'm merely presenting things that interest me and hope you find them to be interesting as well. With what remarkable anxiety we endeavor to obtain a knowledge of what has part of our origin and what wonderful agencies we have arrived at our present condition in the world. How came the world on which we live to be what it is? How came civilized man to be what he is? There are a great variety of theories on these interesting subjects, and the earnestness manifested by the more intelligent of the human race to know the past is even greater than that which impels them to obtain a knowledge of what is to become of them hereafter. Time has produced great revolutions in animated and inanimated nature. If matter existed from all eternity, never had a beginning nor will ever cease to exist, it is most unquestionably true that it is perpetually undergoing change. Change is its fundamental law, and the study of it is one of the most interesting occupations of the human mind. There is an Arabian fable styled The Revolutions of Times, which is thus narrated. The narrator is supposed to have lived many thousands years upon the earth and to have traveled extensively, noted the various changes which took place on the surface of the globe in a great number of places, and to have been conservant with the various generations of man, conversant, sorry, that succeeded each other for more than 3,000 years. The fable may be regarded as illustrative of the antiquities and changes in every division of the globe we inhabit, of every country on it, and particularly America, which is so full of interesting relics of the world, of the past, though so new in written history of the world. The name of this celebrated fabulous traveler was Kadir, and his narrative is as follows. I was passing a populous city and I asked one of its inhabitants how long this city had been built. He said, This is an ancient city. Neither its present inhabitants nor their fathers before them know when it was built. Five hundred years afterwards I passed that way again, but no trace of the city was seen. I saw a man gathering herbs and asked him how long the city that had once occupied that place had been destroyed. The country had always been thus. I said, but there was a city here. 
He then said, We have seen no city here, nor have we heard of such from our fathers. After 500 years, I passed that way again and found a lake, and on it saw a company of fishermen and said to them, When did this land become a lake? They said, Why do you ask this question? This place has never been but what it is now. But heretofore, said I, it was dry land. They said, We never saw it so, nor heard of it from our fathers. Then, after five hundred years, I traveled that way again, and behold, the lake was dried up. I met a solitary man and said to him, When did this spot become dry land? He said, It was always thus. But formerly, said I, it was a lake. And he said, We never say it was nor heard of it before. Five hundred years afterwards I returned and found a populous and beautiful city, finer than it was when I first saw it, and asked one of its inhabitants, When was this city built? And he said, Truly, this is an ancient place. We know not the exact date of its building, neither we nor our fathers. This fabulous narrative is full of water for deep reflection. Just want to pause there and reread that. This fabulous narrative is full of matter for deep reflection. Indeed, it is. Never have I found more compelling of of a short story in these newspapers to sum up the things I've been presenting and the present state of affairs when it comes to my outlook on this realm we inhabit and the shoulders of giants on which we stand. Then better phrase that way right there. A matter for deep reflection. The art of printing would at this day prevent the full application of the fable to changes on the globe's surface, which take place in our time, yet time's revolutions are beautifully portrayed in the narrative. The human race and the globe on which they live have everywhere experienced terrible revolutions, pestilence, wars, and convulsions by fire and water, have annihilated whole races and species of animated nature the proudest works of man and transform the earth's surface again and again in the process of time. In those who differ about the origin of the antiquities of the West, those ruins of a former age, those imperishable immorals of ages long since swallowed up in the ocean of time, would read the Arabian fable, they would not feel so sanguine that they had hit on the right explanation of the origin of the antiquities of America, or of the race or races of men who constructed them. It would be superfluous to ask the wild Arab who was the owner of the superb palace within whose walls he has built his tent, or to inquire of a poor fisherman or plowman about the ruins of Carthage or Troy. Alas! They have vanished and left but the melancholy lesson of the instability of the most stupendous labors of our race. There is the strongest possible evidence that the globe has undergone many terrible convulsions and that the human race have been destroyed by them and by wars and pestilence. That America has been the homes of thousands of millions of human beings through a long period of past perhaps millions of years, there is no reasonable doubt that there have been portions of this long period when the inhabitants were far more enlightened than the various tribes of Indians which Columbus found here. There is also no doubt. The evidences of this superior intelligence consists in our Western antiquities and in those in every section of North and South America. Before we close this article, we shall allude to some of these antiquities and to the recent discoveries of ruined cities in the country known as the Great Basin of California. We will now offer a few remarks on 
the origin of the variety of color of the human skin. There are two grand hypotheses respecting the origin of human complexions. It is asserted by many that diversity of climate and food are all that is required to have produced the red, the black, the white, and that all the intermediate mixtures may result from the same cause, or, in part, from an intermingling of the procreative powers of several races. This idea will admit of another, which is that all mankind originated from one parent stock and that much of the physical and intellectual diversity of human character may have been produced by diversified climate and a custom mode of living, acting through a long series of generations. In opposition to this theory, it is asserted that no distance of space, lapse of time, change of climate, or diversity of diet can possibly change the color of the Ethiopian skin or remove the leopard spots. Lapse of ages will not change a white man and his paternity to the hue or shape of an African. Although the hottest rays of the burning climate of Libya may have fallen upon him for ages unnumbered, and its soil have fed him with roots and berries an equal length of time, it may not brown him deeply or even blacken him, but it will not give him the woolly hair, the African lip and nose and other characteristics of the Ethiopian race. Though a white man may tan very dark, climate, it is said, will never alter the shape of his face, nor make him lose the characteristics of his race. Neither, it is contended, is there any power in the decomposition or digestion of food in the human stomach, and the formation of the blood from it. That is sufficient to make the changes alluded to. Whatever a man may eat, or whatever climate he may inhabit, or whatever air he may breathe, it will not interfere with those first principles of his nature, which exhibit themselves in his color or physical characteristics. Where it is, where it not so, it would be easy for the African in the process of time to get rid of chains of slavery by shaking off his black skin and become a white man. We know very little at the point is disputed, because everybody has proof of it and that the generative influence or the procreative powers will impart all the peculiarities of race. It is this power that gives to the skin its tinge, to the human form its peculiar shape, and imparts every variety to the race. By what laws this principle is governed is a question involved in darkness, and never will be fully understood. The two sexes can jointly perhaps impart to the little embryo in the womb of its mother, some of the characteristics of both parents, and all the characteristics of the race, just as they impart the heredity diseases, gout, consumption, insanity, scrofula, and other malignities, which are transferred from generation to generation. We do not, however, feel warranted in saying that climate and food have nothing to do with our physical characteristics, but merely give the argument to those who do say so. But if these causes or some other have not produced the different colors of races, then how are, to, how are we to account for this diversity? It is quite certain that a white male and a female, nor their descendants through the endless ages, could not beget an Ethiopian child, nor an Ethiopian man and woman white child. In what way, then, did the black and white races originate? If they all come from one couple, and the laws of generation or procreation have always been as now, and climate and food produce no change, then there would be, then there would have to be but one race. The difficulty in reconciled by some in this way, though it is an assumed solution of it, yet it is ingenious, and is very generally believed by theologists, theologians of Bible faith. They assert that before the flood, there was but one race, and that the red. Adam and Eve and all their posterity were of the red complexion. But after the flood, God provided for three races and three different colors, red, black, and white. Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, are said to have been the persons in whom the Almighty laid the foundation of the three complexions. Shem was the firstborn of Noah and was red. Like his father and mother, 
and like all the people of the world before the flood. Dr. Clark says that Shem signifies renown in the language of Noah or pre pure Hebrew. Shem's posterity spread over the finest regions of Upper and Middle Asia, Armenia, Mesopotamia, Assyria, Media, Persia, and the Indus, Ganges, and is what they believed to be China. The word Ham signifies that which was burnt or black. His posterity peopled the hot regions of the earth on both sides of the equator. Josephus says that Adam, or the first man, was a red man made of pure red earth called virgin earth. The word Adam, he says, signifies the color which is red. All the antediluvians were red, and Noah's firstborn Shem was also red or copper colored. Ham was of a glossy black color, and his descendants were destined to live in Africa and southern climes of Asia and the hot climates of the globe. Noah's third son, Japheth, was a white man, the first white man that ever existed. When the news of the birth of Japheth was first received by his father, Noah, the old man seemed to be greatly surprised, even more so that when he, when the first child, Ham, first black child, Ham, was ushered into the world, he saw that Japheth was a fair and ruddy boy, beautifully white, and he said to have cried out in ecstasy, joy and surprise, Japheth, which word became his name. He then said that God would greatly enlarge Japheth and that he should dwell in the tents of Shem and Ham and that the latter should be his servant. Now, again, as I stated before I started this video, these narratives have been changed and perhaps rewritten and sharing some of my Queen Mu uh, insights in the Mayan um, stories of Noah and the lineages and how they've been altered and changed and these stories have been changed as well. These stories don't necessarily align with my own. However, as the author is stating, the principles and explanations for the races are his own and ones he's worth, he finds worth sharing. And you'll see why as we get into the explanations of ancient America um, and why they're important as far as perspective when it comes to these things, though they might not be um, fully accurate. The whole tent of Noah was in an uproar on account of the strange complexion of the child, on being the first black infant that ever was born. Hence, Noah thought he would name the boy as he looked, so he called him Ham, which is black. If this solution of the origin of the three colors is true, is a true one, there was no plurality of fathers in order to change the color of the child. But Noah was the father of a pretty red, deep and glossy black, and a beautiful white child, all born of a red or copper-colored mother, a descendant of Adam, who was made of pure red or virgin earth, and Eve, who was made from one of his red ribs. There is a tradition of the priests of the most ancient race of Africans, which corroborates this origin of colors. This tradition, after explaining the origin, much as above, says that after the death of Noah, these three sons set about to divide his property fairly, which consisted of gold, silver, vestments of silk, linen and wool, horses, camels, dorm sheep, goats, arms, furniture, corn, and other provisions, tobacco and pipes. They spent nearly a whole day in assorting all of these things and then smoked a friendly pipe together and agreed to defer the portion until they had rested for the night. The white brother awoke first from his sleep and moved by avarice. He seized all the gold and silver and precious stones. The most beautiful vestments loaded the best camels with them and put off for the top of his speed to the country which his white posterity has ever since occupied. The Moor, or Tawny brother, the red one, next awoke and seeing what his white brother had done, he, in great haste, seized the remainder of the camel's horse's oxen and the second best choice of the vestments left and retired to another part of the world where his descendants still reside. The black son, who was the laziest brother of the three, awoke and saw that what he had done and had no alternative but to seize on the lot of remnants and tobacco and pipes, which he did, and sat down in a pervasive melancholy mood and swore that one day he would be revenged. He finally landed somewhere in Egypt or Libya, Africa, and was not yet been able to get 
full satisfaction, though in some of the general massacres of the whites where the blacks have had the power, they have had a partial fulfillment of the prediction and the tradition. Very learned writers have seized upon this tradition to prove that their theory about the origin of the diversity of human complexion. It shows what resources men will grasp at to sustain an argument. The man in his different variety emanated in other in order of nature from different sources and has progressed by slow degrees his present state of perfection or superiority over the rest of the animal creation and far above the original parent stock is the theory of some very eminent men. But it is not our intention to decide on the reasonableness or absurdity of this theory, which only suppose that man is the production of nature, like a tree, a plant, or any other animal. To those who suppose that the Bible account of his origin is a mere allegory, resting upon no higher authority than some of the many traditionary accounts of pagan or heathen nations, we would say erect your own theory, mm, indeed, and then carefully examine it and see if it seems more plausible than that given by Moses or others. The celebrated Mondobo, who labored hard to prove that man descended from monkeys, may have felt as though he had solved the problem of his origin, but his arguments, when tested by the rules of reason, seem still absurd than those we have been considering. We have thus dwelt upon the questions of man's origins because it has much to do with the question of American antiquities. Whence came the people that constructed the mounts, Dumuli, and other evidences that America is an old country, peopled by hundreds of millions of human beings, far more enlightened than the red man when Columbus landed upon our shores? Let us commence with the statement that when Noah made his will, he gave Shem all east to Ham, all Africa, and to Japheth, the continent of Europe. With all its isles and the northern parts of Asia and perhaps America, which is now in possession of his posterity, at that time the various continents of the world may have been all united. We need not wonder how people from Asia and Europe got to America 4,000 or 50,000 years ago, as there is the strongest evidence that within the length of time, the whole face of the globe may have been changed. Indeed, if this is not long enough to take the history of the Chinese, which goes back millions of years, the various islands of the Pacific Ocean may be only small portions of a greater body of land that once united Asia and America, and the same may be said of the Atlantic in Europe and Africa. Indeed, there is strong evidence that such has been the condition of the globe at a period far back in the past. Let us look, then, at the antiquities of America. In no part of the country of the old world are there so many evidences of antiquity as in America. Asiatic and European antiquities and relics of a remote past have been celebrated in poetry and sober history. The ancient empires of Rome, Greece, Babylon, Egypt, Persia, China, and of the rest of Europe, Asia, and Africa, have engaged the profound attention of the learned. And now America is about to awake her story from an oblivious sleep and tell her tale of antiquities. The mounds in Tamuli of the West are to be ranked among the most wonderful antiquities of the world on account of their number, magnitude, and obscurity of origin. Several hundred of them are to be found on the banks of the mighty Mississippi, the largest of which is near Wheeling on the Ohio. This mound is 50 rods in circumference and 90 feet high. It must have stood near some large city, compared to which any western city of the present day appears but a small village. It is filled with numberless human skeletons and was doubtless a place of general deposit of the dead for ages who were placed one above another until it reached its natural climax, agreeing with the slope rising from the base or foundation. That it was made by the ancestors of our modern Indians, unless they have greatly degenerated, is not credible. 
and the idea that it was is now given up by everyone. Its magnitude and vast numbers of dead deposited in it prove that a race of men who live a roving, hunting, and fishing life could not have transported their dead so far to one place. In some of these mounds, not only bones of the dead are found, but implements of warfare entirely unknown to the Indians. And In Marietta, the first place settled in Ohio, there are the ruins of extensive fortifications consisting of walls and mounds of earth running in straight lines from six to ten feet high and some forty feet broad at their base. One of these forts covers nearly fifty acres of land. There are openings in the fortification which are supposed to have been once thoroughed by a busy multitude and used as gangways, with a passage from one of them formed by two parallel walls of earth leading towards the river. The contrivance is evidently one for defense against the surprise of an enemy. Within these forts are elevated squares, situated at the corners, 180 feet long by 130 feet broad, 9 feet high and level on top. On these squares, there were doubtless placed some modes of annoyance to a besieging enemy, such as engines to throw stones, or a dart or spear, or some other weapon of defense which they may have adopted. Around these forts are large mounds filled with human bones, articles of pottery, charcoal, and other relics. The base of one of these mounds is over a hundred feet in circumference, and is encompassed by a ditch defended by a parapet or wall beyond the ditch, breast high and having an entrance to the fort. In one place was found the skeleton of a man buried exactly east and west, having on his breast a quantity of isinglass, isinglass, which is considered sacred by the Mexicans and adored as a deity. There are those who argue that the Romans built this fort. Again, there are those who argue that the Romans built this fort. It is quite certain that it corresponds with the description which Josephus gives of the forms of Roman camps and military camps. For 400 years, the Romans had all of the west of Europe attached to their empire, and it is asserted they may have found their way to America, as well as the Welsh and Scandinavians. When they invaded the island of Britain before the Christian era, we are informed in the history of England that their ships were so large and drew such a depth of water that the soldiers had to swim ashore in order to land. We only mention this as an opinion of some who express it in all candor. In corroboration of this opinion that both the Grecians and the Romans had a knowledge of the existence of America and had visited it prior to the invasion of Britain, we offer to the discovery of one of the planters of South America, not more than a quarter of a century ago. He resided near Montevideo and discovered in a field a short distance a sort of tombstone. He caused it to be raised, and under it he found two exceedingly ancient swords, a helmet and shield, much destroyed by rust, also an earthen vessel of great capacity. Upon this stone slate was a Greek inscription which was translated as follows. During the dominion of Alexander, the son of Philip, king of Macedon, in the 63rd Olympiad, Ptolemaeus. The rest could not be deciphered on account of the ravages of time. On the handle of one of the swords was a portrait of Alexander the Great, and on the helmet there is sculptured work representing Achilles dragging the corpse of Hector around the walls of Troy. This discovery is regarded as proof that some ancient Greek philosopher had once trod the soil of Brazil and La Plata in South America. It is not impossible, but the Danes, Norwegians, and Welsh may have first obtained some knowledge of the Western Islands and territories from the Romans and handed down the story till the Scandinavians or Norwegians discovered Ireland 
Greenland and America many centuries before Columbus. There is evidence that a Greek fleet once moored on the coast of Brazil, and it is supposed that this was the fleet of Alexander the Great. The ancient Greeks and Romans fitted out voyages of discoveries that never returned, and these cases were so frequent that it was made criminal to engage in them anymore. The reader then will see that the above is not all conjecture. Indeed not. And as I postulated in previous episodes, I do believe Alexander and his war with the giants was taking place in the Mississippi Valley and that the land of King Og was in the Mississippi Valley and that the walls I've documented in several videos, the giant walls that Alexander the Great built was all around that region. And the tombs in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, all the way to Arizona, show a stout proof that the Romans not only visited, but in my mind, called America their home, their first home. And that after a cataclysm, migrated from the Gulf of Mexico, the true fertile crescent, into the Mediterranean. Continuing on. There is, excuse me, the reader then will see that the above is not all conjecture. M. Volney, in his view of America, has explained the analogy between the ancient nations of Italy and Greece and the American Indians. Indeed, there are a great variety of proofs of resemblance between the ancient Romans and Grecians and the American Indians. On the other hand, there are traits of the existence of white nations in Georgia, Kentucky, and other states long before Columbus. The gold mines of North Carolina and Georgia have near them the remains of ancient works. Many shafts have been sunk in pursuit of ore, and judging from the masses thrown up, we find one of the shafts must have penetrated a quartz rock to a great depth, as about 30 feet still lies open to view. Nearby are the remains of a small furnace the walls of which had been formed of soapstone, so as to endure great heat without fracturing. In Habersham, Georgia, was dug out of the earth at a great depth a vessel made of tin, copper, and iron. The miners of the present day frequently find earthen vessels, crucibles, which bear the heat much better than those of our own. On the top of a mountain near the same place are the remains of a stone wall, which exhibit the angles of a well-constructed fortification, and guards the only accessible point of ascent to its summit. Mr. Richardson of the same county, on whose farm was opened the first gold mine in Georgia, on excavating the stone stratum of the bed of a small river, found three feet below the surface in solid rock about a peck of flints elegantly wrought for gun locks, differing a little from those now in use, yet situated for firearms. These flints were taken to Middle Mick, Middle Give, Georgia, and sold as curiosities at a quarter of a dollar each. The result of all of these evidences of antiquity is that in all probability America is a very old country and had been at times discovered by the Danes coming from Lapland, Norway, Finland, and Europe and Malay, Polynesia, and Australian tribes coming from the Asiatic shores and from the islands of the Pacific Ocean and settling America from the west and by the ancient Romans, Grecians, and the people of the island Atlantis in the Atlantic Ocean, settling America from the east. Now remember what they were talking about the times before Noah and the land of the Red Man. The Egyptian histories firmly show this to be the land of the Americas. The story of Queen Mu tells a very similar story to Noah's flood and the and the leaving in a giant ship or ark, and a similar story, but obviously with the variance in details. Universal story. And that um, judging by these older records, that Atlantis may not have been an island in the Atlantic, but was America after all. It is not probable that the builders of our western mounds were the first settlers of America. 
an interesting article from the pen of W.M. Wirth on this subject says that there are evidences that at least three distinct races of men have successively lived in America before the discovery of Columbus. This is uh, something that I've been stating when I discuss, like the man quoted from that story in the beginning of the article, that he comes back every 500 years to see the climate and the layout of the land changing considerably. Civilizations, civilizations come and they go and they're wiped clean. And the, those who set their homes and build their and build their tents, so to say, on top, have no recollection of those who came before them. And this has happened several successive times. I say at least four, but it could be thousands. Who knows? An interesting blah, 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 sorry. The monuments of primitive races he finds in the stone walls, brick hearths, metals of copper, silver swords, and implements of iron found in digging the Louisville Canal. A shoe of iron, something like a horseshoe, was also found, encrusted with rust of ages, and a copper axe weighing two pounds, singularly tempered and of a peculiar construction. These relics are attributed to a race of men who must have disappeared many centuries ago. To them, who we must attribute also the hieroglyphic characters found on the limestone bluff, the remains of cities and fortifications in Florida, and the bricks found at Louisville in regular hearths nine to ten feet below the surface, having on them the coals of the last domestic fire. The second race, and less civilized and progressive, he attributes to the mounds in Tamule, the whole western region, from Lake Erie to Florida, and the Rocky Mountains, all of which display great labor and less intelligence. The third race are the Indians now existing in the Western territories. In the profound silence and solitude of these regions and above the bones of a buried world, how must the philosophic mind mediate upon the transitory state of human existence and the terrible revolutions of the earth through the agencies of fire and water? Here in America, generation after generation has lived, warred, grown old, and passed away, and their names, their nations, their language have perished into utter oblivion. The few relics of their once populous abodes is all we have. Call not this country a new world, it is old. Age after age, one physical revolution after another has passed over it, but who shall tell its history? Convulsions of the globe, which have separated America from the continents east and west of it. Naturalists entertain the opinion that there has been a whole continent reaching from the north of Europe to the Bering Straits and, and uniting Europe with America and Asia on the north, and which may have continued south from Bering Strait down the Pacific, uniting America and China on the west. If so, it is easy to perceive that before the connection was torn away by the action of water and fire, the people of Asia and Europe might have come to America, or was it one and the same, India Superior? And certain, remember even Columbus, who, as we've stated several times, came long, long, long before several wipings of, of, of ancient races here in America, called this land Asia. And on the earliest maps, it's labeled as such. So perhaps the word of man continued and the cataclysms and the convulsions separating the two are relatively recent. But the memory is still alive, or was at least in the 1500s. It is certain that Africa and South America approach each other in a remarkable manner along the coast of Guinea on the, on the African side, and the Pernambuco on the South American. They stretch towards each other as though they had been once united. The innumerable islands scattered all over the Pacific, populous with men, more than intimates, a period when the continents of Asia and America were united, and that the migration of men and animals might have taken place. Several tribes of our southern Indians have traditions that they came from the east or through the Atlantic Ocean. The various convulsions of the Earth's surface, whose history is lost in the bosom of time, may have sunk the land and increased the waters on the surface. There is an account of a certain large island 
called by the ancients Atlantis, to which, as the story runs, it was the custom for princes to resort before they were fitted to sit on thrones. This Atlantis was supposed to be in the Atlantic Ocean. Plato and others mentioned this island. An Egyptian priest located it opposite the Strait of Gibraltar, which would place it between the southern end of Europe and the northern part of Africa, and the continent of America. This priest asserted that there was an easy passage from the, this island to others, which lay adjacent to a large continent exceeding in size all Europe and Asia. It is said that the people of Atlantis made incursions into Europe and Africa and subdued all Libya as far as Egypt, Europe, and Asia Minor, but were finally driven back to their Atlantic territories by the Athenians. Shortly after this, Plato says there was a tremendous earthquake lasting for a day and a night, an overflowing of the sea, which swallowed up all of Atlantis, its warlike people, and their splendid cities, and thus added a vast region to the Atlantic Ocean. Irving's Columbus and Dr. Robinson, the historian, also mention the story of Atlantis. They say that at the period of its existence, it may have been the bridge that permitted travel from Europe and Africa to America. Connected, it may have been with other smaller islands. The Azores, Madeiras, and Tenerife, Dr. Robinson supposed that this island was destroyed very far back in the ages of antiquity. The, celebra the celebrated Eleusid also alludes to Atlantis. He called it as large as all of Africa and alluded to the tradition that it was swallowed by an earthquake. From all these traditions and historic assertions, we may safely infer that a passage from Asia, Europe, and Africa to America was easy in the remote ages of antiquity. What then are the causes of the disappearance of the ancient nations of America? There is no doubt but that though the omnipotent agency of fire and water and war and pestilence, ancient America has been depopulated. The Arabian fable, which we have quoted above, solves the question. Volney was the first writer who spoke of Lake Ontario as a, a volcanic origin. And now it is supposed that all our lakes are such. The slow wearing away of the falls of Niagara will yet, in all human probability, drain all of our western lakes. When the strata of rock is worn away over which the water now plunges, the lakes of the west will soon be drained. In the event of such a catastrophe, the waters will soon flow into the headwater channel of all the rivers northeast and south of Lake Ontario. After coming on a level with the heads of the short streams passing into the lake on its easterly side, the rivers running southeast and north from that part of Lake Ontario, as high up as the village of Lyons, are a part of the Chimung, Chinago, Unadilla, Susquehanna, Delaware, Mohawk, and St. Lawrence, the valets of which would become the drains of the western lakes, thus sweeping away all the works of man, where the lowness of the country should invite a rush of water, leaving only the highlands and mountains as islands. When the work of submersion is over, no one can hardly imagine the consequences that will result from the wearing away of the stratum over which the waters of the Niagara flow, called Niagara Falls. We allude to these facts merely to show that the action of fire and water produces astonishing revolutions of the globe's surface, and therefore they are the chief causes of the depopulation of ancient America. Pestilence, too, is a powerful agent in this work of depopulation. The overflowing of the Nile in Egypt and the subsidence of the waters for more than 500 miles in length and 25 in width leaves an intolerable stretch that originates plague, which sweeps to entirety its thousands in the country. No one can tell to what extent similar causes may have operated in depopulating America or to what extent they may again operate in the course of time. It would be curious to many of our readers to go into a further description of American antiquities, but we have already written a long article. The discoveries on the Muskegon River, 
the discovery of remains of ancient pottery in many places in the West, the traces of Egyptian customs in Kentucky, and the discovery of curious images made of ivory in a mound near Cincinnati, supposed to represent the Virgin Mary and her child Jesus, the tracks of men and animals found on the rocks of a mountain in Tennessee, ruins of ancient works at Circle Well in Paint Creek, Ohio, including ancient wells and other curious things, traces of ancient cities on the Mississippi, and almost innumerable evidences of ancient habitation by different people than the American Indian. But we must close by an allusion to a recent curious discovery in California, the correctness of which may, however, require some further confirmation, though there is nothing in it more wonderful than we find in authenticated facts of the past. The California paper tells us that ruined cities have been discovered in a tract of country known as the Great Basin, which is on the west of the Rocky Mountains, bounded by the Mormon settlements in Utah, the Gila, Rio Grande, and the Sierra Nevada. Captain Walker, the famous mountaineer, Mr. Bialy, and others who have traveled over some of this region have asserted that they have seen strewn all around evidences of ancient cities in a populous country of civilized people which have long since disappeared. Pyramids, mounds, fortifications, and even an existing race of people of a various curious character, who, though not competent to construct works like those which the ruins proved to have once existed there, yet are a highly agricultural people. When these stories are authenticated, we will again refer to them. Amen. Thanks for sticking with me through that one. A bit long-winded. But yes, um, one need only, if interested, after this, to go back and watch my Anomalous America California episode. I describe many of these pyramids, these ancient cities. There are dozens. Um, giants, ancient mines, on and on and on. And it's quite endless. And you only can follow the American antiquity rabbit hole, so to say. I have probably at least five videos, but all of my Anomalous America series touch quite endlessly on this and cooperate in an unbelievable way what this gentleman is writing about and corresponding to this fable. But I wanted to wait to do this article to write around the new year um, as the topic of time is one of my favorites. And this author alludes to it in quite a, a beautiful manner, as does that Arabian fable, which I do strongly suggest you look up and read the entire fable for yourself. Um, made my hair stand up, and I'm sure for many of you uh, new to my material and, and those that have seen quite a large share of it would definitely see the correlations. But yeah, thanks for sticking with me through this article. Just under an hour. Um, look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Have a wonderful day, you guys. God bless.